Dr. Fizz, Theoretical Physics, the cauchy riemann Conditions, or also called the cauchy riemann Equations or the cauchy riemann Relations. Well, they deal with complex numbers and complex functions. Here's a nice little way to look at a complex number, which I'm going to consider as a constant, a something like 3, and b something like 4, and then you have a plus bi or a plus ib is the complex number. Since i is the square root of minus 1, we have an imaginary component. Note that the a and the b are real, so that you have isolated the i and nothing's hidden here. You have real a plus i times real b. So real part is a, imaginary part's b, complex constant. Complex variable is basically letting a be different things. So I use the traditional x here for a variable and y is being used for the second variable. And the z variable here is a combination of these two. It's x plus i, y. x and y being real. A complex function, well, what you do there is you feed in a complex number and out comes a complex number. So you have a complex variable as the input and the output is complex also in general and we're going to write that as two functions, a u function of x and y. Notice that x and y get input here you put those in there and that affects what the u is and here when you uh, look at the x and y in this other function v you get the result that hits the i so that you have your general form here of a complex output u and v being real. The question is this is differentiation well defined for complex numbers? That's question one. Well, if we set up the derivative the way we would in calculus, we take here the limit as delta z goes to zero, where we compare the function at some point z plus delta z to a point at z, and we subtract these and divide by delta z. That's our definition of a derivative. And in the simple case where you have just like x you get then the slope. In other words, this is you know the rise over the run. When you deal with a complex function, you have a delta c, z that's more complicated. You have a delta x plus an i delta y in there. And then you have here u evaluated x plus delta x, and you have y plus delta y, so you have to advance both of these variables here, and you subtract from it the u of x, y. And the same thing for the v. You advance the uh, x and y by their deltas and then subtract. So this is the definition for the derivative when you extend it to the complex case. And now I worry if this is defined in a way that's not ambiguous. Well, this uh, picture here is nice to just get the general idea, but don't take this picture too seriously. What we're doing here is we're saying if we have like an x and a y feeding into a function, then the value of that function, we're going to use that in another dimension, like this height. So you have uh, x and you have y, and then you feed it into a function, you have a height. And by looking at this, you can see that, well, you know, I can take this derivative by advancing along the east direction, let the delta y be zero. Or I could go along the north direction, if you think of this as north, this uh, y, delta y be in equal to some value where the delta x is equal to like zero. Then uh, I wonder if I get the same result. So we're actually going to do this both ways and demand that the result be the same and when we do that we get the cauchy riemann conditions. So let's do it. Let's first of all zip along the x-axis so delta z is delta x and delta y is zero.
And then here's our formula for the derivative. Notice that delta y being 0 gives zeros wherever you have a delta y. They're all gone. All the delta y's are gone. And what you are left with is, according to the laws of partial differentiation, when you have here x plus delta x, and you are subtracting the value where you know your function is at x, divided by delta x, holding the y constant, that's the partial of u with respect to x. Over here we have the partial of v with respect to x. Notice the i is there. Now we consider the slope along the y-axis and along the y-axis we have delta x equal to zero so all of the delta x's now go away and we're left with in the denominator i delta y. So here we have the partial of u with respect to y and there's an i down there in the denominator hanging around. And then over here we have i times the partial of v with respect to y with the i still hanging around down in that denominator. You'll see that the i's cancel for the second term. And here if I multiply top and bottom by i, I get minus i the partial of u with respect to y. And here I have a plus the partial of v with respect to y. Now I'm going to demand that the real part here, the partial of u at respect to x, be equal to the real part here, the partial of v with respect to y. Now you can remember this as follows. u comes before v in the alphabet, x comes before y, and when you do the respective first, you know, the u with x and then the second one, v with y, they're equal with a plus sign. Now if you look at this other one here, this one here, up here with this one here, you have v with x like you flip them and you have u with y like you have here, you know, v is the second of the u and the v thing and x is the first and here u is the first of the u v thing and then y is the second. So when you do that you have a minus sign and that is an easy way to remember the cauchy riemann equations or the cauchy riemann conditions where the partial of u at respect to x gets the plus sign with the partial of v at respect to y. They're each like the respective first and second uh, variables. And then here when you s do the swap and have u with y you know, and v with x, you get a minus sign in there. So there are the equations and here are the mathematicians after which these are named Cauchy and Riemann. And the next question that we will pursue in our next section is question two, is integration defined in a way that's not ambiguous? And we'll see that has to deal with path independence. And that's the topic of our next section.